Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who've started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 31 with filmmaker, surfer, and changemaker, Cyrus Sutton. This episode was brought to you by Danner. Since 1932, Danner has been crafting high-quality, durable boots built to endure the harshest climates. I wore Danner boots hiking all over Yosemite, and they held up great and looked amazing. One of their best new styles is the Mountain 600. Danner partnered with Vibram to create a classically styled shoe with lightweight innovation and extreme durability. I also love the Mountain Light Cascade. It's the boot worn for the movie Wild, which documents Cheryl Strait's epic journey along the Pacific Crest Trail. Danner makes boots for the U.S. military, and since the 1930s, they've proudly made boots in the USA in their Oregon factory. They also have one of the best taglines ever, the original outsider. If you have a wild idea worth living and you need a good boot to do it in, check out Danner. You can find some of the best Danner styles, including the Mountain Light and the Mountain 600 at REI and REI.com. Today's guest is a really thoughtful, introspective young man. At only 34 years old, Cyrus Sutton has produced Emmy award-winning films like Stoked and Broke. He's lived out of his van for several years. And more recently, he's tackled a subject that affects us all, how we grow our food through a film called Island Earth, which he talks about. Cyrus also shares some gems about what it really takes to live wildly, all sides of what happens when you follow your dreams. He talks about his views on social media, living in the Pacific Northwest, the future of storytelling, how you can live out your own wild idea, and so much more. I had a few people pre-listen to this show and they said this was by far their favorite show. I hope you enjoy it. All right, today we have on Cyrus Sutton. Cyrus, thanks for coming on the show. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thanks, Shelby. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and you're calling in from Hawaii right now. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm from, calling in from Hawaii. I'm in Honolulu. Um, I'm out here shooting a piece on um, a reciprocal gardening network for Guayaquil and um, doing a little surfing along the way. Good for you. I just missed you because I was in your neighborhood in Oregon and it's so beautiful there. I think the ideal situation would be to have a home in Oregon and one in Hawaii. I don't know. Hmm. So let's... Yeah, maybe. I'm, we'll see. That would be amazing. You get escape the winners. Yeah, those winners seem a little gnarly down there. Let's talk about Gyaki, Yerba Mate. I'm pretty excited about it. You work with some great brands. I want to talk about Sunblock Company, Monda, and Gyaki, and how these relationships came to be, and you know how you've managed to make a living not only being a filmmaker and following your passions, but doing it sustainably by working with really interesting brands. Yeah. Um, well, I, just, I started out making films, and um, first I, I started surfing professionally when I was 18, and that led really quickly because I got a staph infection in Samoa. I, I got behind the lens and made a surf film in 19. And that was a really successful film called Riding Waves and changed the trajectory, kind of changed the trajectory of my life in a sense that I, I saw that I could be, that it was not only fun and I could still travel, but I, I had a knack for storytelling and, and creating, you know, films. So that was, I'm 34 now. That was when I was 19. So, um, that's 15 years ago. That, that's a, that's at a time when surf films and DVDs, um, could be really lucrative. So that kind of started, um, this notion for me of that I could create content and then social media came along and I think I got re I started a blog called quarter right TV, which, you know, was about DIY surf and outdoor culture, fixing your own gear, health tips, and uh, interviews with interesting people. Um, and that started about six or seven years ago. And we had hundreds of videos up and Reef. And I made a surf film called Stoked and Broke. 
um, along you know, in the middle of that. And Reef hit me up um, to ride for them again, just kind of as a cultural ambassador, because I was putting out a lot of content and social media was starting to take off and allowing athletes to tell their stories online. And I was kind of perfectly positioned with my background as both a filmmaker and having worked in LA for uh, close to 12 years by that point. Um, and also having, you know, refined kind of a, an outdoor craft like surfing and longboarding. So I hit, I just, I was lucky the timing, I guess. And now I found myself working with different brands and able to, you know, kind of pick and choose the, the brands that, that I feel exemplify, um, you know, business change making in, in the, in the private sector and business done well. So I work with, um, with Guayaki. I'm, I'm head of their media. Actually, it's not, I'm not an ambassador for them. I'm more of a, it's a, it's a full-time job. I'm an employee just like anybody else. And, and I'm, and they're creating, they're trying to build out, um, both social media and storytelling platforms on their website, you know, telling, doing a series of series of videos and, and they've hired me on to basically kind of help them birth that sector of um, their business. So I do that. I work with Hydro Flask as an ambassador, Reef as an ambassador, um, which is basically just um, paid Instagram posts like once a month. I'll, I'll mention them and I with Reef, I test their products. Oh, Hydro Flask, I'll give them feedback and also you know, go on a, a trip a year although I'm not doing that as much anymore um, because I'm focusing you know, on my sunblock company um, that I've started with a handful of friends that I, that I started Corduroy with called Monda. And yeah, that's, that's what we're up to today. <laughs> it's awesome. It comes in a beautiful package. Um, I have some right now in that beautiful wood little tin. I love it. So I think what's great about you is you already just kind of explained, you know, you had a wild idea from the time you were 19 and you've continued to just pursue these wild ideas. I was talking to another filmmaker this morning, Devin Basson, and she's like, you know, ask Cyrus what it's been like. She said, you know, from a fan's perspective, there's so many filmmakers she looks up to, but with you, you've evolved so much as a filmmaker and the fans have been able to see your evolution. So you went from doing these surf movies to stoked and broke, which from being from San Diego, it's obviously one of my favorite movies because I relate so much to it and I understood the places where you went but now you're doing these films about food and about policy and about so much more maybe you could just talk about that you know we get to see it which is really exciting for us but you're in it so maybe you can talk a little bit about your own evolution and what's influenced you and and kind of the reaction from people as well yeah I mean I, I love to do I love what you said about, you know, wild, wild ideas. Um, cause that's kind of always been, I, I'm just addicted to learning. And I think that's outdoor and, and action sport culture has attracted a lot of young people in our generation who are really interested in, in constantly learning and pushing themselves, um, in ways that are outside the box that aren't defined by society. And they're not like a tr- tried and true path of go to college and, and do these different things. I, I, my whole family's professors, but I, I was just so in love with the outdoors and so in love with tinkering and and creating and learning and challenging myself that I couldn't sit in a classroom and, and, and just do a lesson plan. I had to, you know, when I learned, wanted wanted to learn filmmaking when I was 19, I just went to one college class and saw all the textbooks and bought the textbooks and read them cover to cover and then just made my film from scratch without any experience. And so I think, with the internet as a tool now and, and having so much information and knowledge at our fingertips, it really allows, you know, people to either look up skate tricks and, and, you know, and, and collaborate and learn, you know, how to be a better athlete or be a better media person or, or whatever um, it is that, that we're interested in. And it's been interesting because it's, I feel like an industry has built up around that more than us trying to fit into an industry. And I definitely think that's, what's been the reality in my case where I've, I've just followed what I've been interested in and, and it's probably the worst business decision. It wouldn't teach you that in business <laughs> school, but it's, it's, it's seeming like the, the market is kind of following where we're going because it's, it's it, social media allows it to be, you know, you, you, you to infect or inoculate other people. And so that all of a sudden becomes popular because it's fun. And what's popular is then seen as being good for marketing for companies who, 
align with those values. So um, for me, Island Earth, my new film, it's about Hawaii, it's about food, it's about indigenous knowledge and cultural traditions and things that when I was probably 21 or 22, I wouldn't have that much interest in. Um, I was more interested in style and, um, and adventure and kind of, you know, more sensational things. But the more I've gotten to travel and go to interesting places around the world, the more I've seen that, you know, there's a re there's an underlying kind of energy there that has either felt good or has felt weak. And what feels really good is when cultures are connected to their traditions, there's, there's a culture around their food. There's a, there's a connection to the basics that sustain them. And, and sometimes, you know, to be honest, traveling around and, and going to these pristine places, it starts to feel a little exploitive. Um, it feels like you're just bringing back images that, you know, you don't quite know what they're, what's going to be done with them. If it's going to push a bunch of people to go there in, in limited resource in places like limited resources, like waves, you know, you don't quite know the impacts that you're having. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've gotten more aware of my impacts and, and what I'm doing. So I've, because of that, I've wanted to make a film that dives more into um, the reasons why. Uh, backing up a sec, like Hawaiian society, you could argue Hawaiian society is what created surfing culture today. I mean, modern surfing culture has been more influenced by Hawaiian culture than any other culture. And they were only able to play in the ocean and develop this artistry on the waves because they had their basic systems of survival so dialed that they had so much extra food and so much extra time that they could play and hula and, and go surfing. And the older I get and the more I see what we're doing to our planet, I think, you know, I wonder if we're going to be able to leave that for our kids. And so I wanted to look at what was it about Hawaiian society that allowed them to create this leisure time that allowed them to create this lifestyle that I've been able to enjoy and so this film's kind of a, a, an homage to that and also a really fascinating opportunity for me to push my skill set way beyond anything I've ever done into the worlds of academia and science and fact checkers and, you know, making taking on a contentious issue like GMOs and not just sensationalizing it for the sake of views or or for um, to to appeal to one side of the audience. I wanted to really make something that had. Um, academic merit you know and, and it is it's we're getting we're doing licensed de licensing deals with ivy league colleges and you know it's it's, be, it's been something for me is not going to college and pursuing my passion it's it's been a, a new front a new frontier because i've wanted to prove that i could do something that could be within those those walls of of academia and, and be valid and, and not just be sort of a second class citizen in terms of education because because I, I didn't do it and I just wanted to follow, you know, what I wanted to do. So it's been gratifying and it's been an adventure. It's been a learning experience and, and really freaking scary at times, you know, uh, when you're, when you're, when you're making films like these and, and you don't, you don't quite understand the end. Um, when you're making surf films, it tends to be a lot more simplistic and um, like stoked and broke was a story of gentrification and, in San Diego, but I knew the ending, you know, or I knew the story. This is something that was, I didn't know at all. So it's been fun. So, okay. You talked about a lot of things. One, I love that your parents were professors because that's. Sorry. Same. I just totally hijacked your question. No, I it was before. great. Sorry. I, I know <laughs> this is exactly what you're supposed to do, Cyrus. I'm here to just let you talk. You know, I also come from a family where my mom was a professor as well, and, and my stepdad worked in a college, so I totally get this. You know, you talked about fear in making a story, and this was a big story. How long did it take you to make this film? Yeah, it took three years. So what is your self-talk when there's, like, this fear of the unknown and how it's going to end? Like, what, what do you do? What are your little tactics or routines to help you kind of finish a story or a huge project like this that involves so many things. Yeah, I had an advice from an editor named Lyman Smith who's worked on Racing Extinction and The Cove. Um, great documentary editor. At times when I was feeling kind of lost in the trees or I couldn't see the forest through the trees and just kind of lost in the storyline, he, he gave me this 
really great advice that stuck with me. And he said the documentaries at their best are structured research, meaning that they, um, and, and they're, and they're executed with a spirit of curiosity and humility. Um, meaning that, that basically you don't have to know all the answers and you don't have to know what the, what the ending is going to be. You can go about it with, with just a spirit of learning, you know, and, and just a spirit of, of letting the story unfold and being as prepared as possible to capture uh, what unfolds. And so that, that to me, when, when I'm dealing with really complex stories that I can't completely understand at the beginning, I just have a hunch that there's something interesting there um, that saved me not having to have all the answers at once. That's good advice for anything at life in life, just not having to have all the answers. What's the one thing you learned through this film that you didn't expect to learn or that you really took away from it all? Yeah, that did a lot of people are our allies when it comes to the environment and it comes to the planet. I think everybody thinks that they're doing the right thing and, and that's how we get up in, in the morning. And, um, I think we have a lot of allies in science that I didn't quite understand or know. I think we have a lot of allies in our government, but I think that overall there are sort of deeper strains of, of disease, you know, if, if you will, in our society that are structured around quarterly profits and fiduciary responsibilities to shareholders. There's a case um, called the Revlon case that happened in the 90s. And since then, corporations have been largely run by the board of directors who are the investors. And um, you and I, Shelby, could have a great idea for a product. and and But quarter after quarter after quarter, if our chief concern is showing um, increased value or profits for our shareholders, it's going to force us to make decisions that erode or chip away at the original intention, the original altruistic or, or life-changing intention for a brand that we create. And so I think that anything in this system, that's, that's kind of, if there's one thing that that I've gleaned from this and, and one deeper truth is that capitalism as it stands right now, unless we get behind something like B Corp, B corporations and, and look at that altering of those bylaws that allow companies to actually stay true to their vision and allow people to, you know, cause people are good. I think more than more, more people I talk to um, in different areas and walks of life. And the more I travel, I think we're universally good. We're, we're taught, or I think sometimes we think we're bad or we're evil. I think people are generally care about the planet. They generally want to create a better home for their kids, but it's the structure that this pernicious structure that makes us kind of go down this route that is quickly destroying the planet quickly. Um, and it's creating, um, infinite, the idea, illusion of infinite growth in a very finite world of resources. So that's what I've learned. That's, that's a good learning. Yeah. I worked for a public company. It's, it's not easy. I don't anymore. And actually a couple of the sponsors on this, on this podcast have all been B Corporation products. And we're talking to one now, uh, Mirror Water Bottles. They're out of Bend, Oregon. They're B Corp. Toad & Co. right now. They're B Corp. It's been so interesting to see a couple of these B Corps pop up in the uh, outdoor arena, you know, what advice, there's a lot of people who want to be filmmakers and storytellers right now today. If you could give them one piece of advice, you know, what's your best piece of advice if this is the path they want to take? What is it really, and also, what's the other side of it? What does it really take? You mean like the dark side or? or... <laughs> I mean the reality. What does it really take to do what you do? Everybody kind of sees you like, living in vans and longboarding, but I, I mean, I, I know you a little bit, you work your tail off and to do what you do to live wildly, to have these adventures, it's not always easy. So not just the dark side, but like the reality of it. W what is that? Yeah, I guess the reality is I'm just an obsessive person and I want to do things my way and I'm willing to work four times harder than anybody else to do that. 
And so that's what living in vans for me was always about. It wasn't going to some idyllic location and taking a profile shot of my van. It was about going to the mountains in the summer when I was, you know, too hot on the coast and or, or too hot in the valleys, you know, editing some film and sweating, you know, going through heat waves and sweating on in the back of my van, editing from a solar panel 10 years ago to make, to do some animations on my film and working 80 hours a week and then being next to a trail or a beach to get my sanity. It was living in a van was always about maximum work, minimum um, rent, minimum expenditure of income and maximum flexibility with being able to enjoy the nature around Southern California and Central California. So it was just a very practical means for that. I think, you know, doing anything your own way or living a wild idea is going to take much more work than somebody not doing that or just going to school and, and doing what you're told. Um, I think that as, as the economy shifts, I think we're entering this point right now where this used to be maybe more of a far flung um, lifestyle, but now I think it's becoming more and more viable as automation takes over and we're seeing white collar jobs. We will see, I believe white collar jobs in the next decade become more obsolete um, and more automated creative um, people and people who are kind of living life and in, in pursuing things that they're good at out of the box and building an audience from there. I think it's going to become more and more of a recognized way of living. Um, but if you got to be, you got to be incredibly passionate, but that's the beauty of it is right. Is I mean, if you, if you are in love with something, you don't count the hours that you're doing it. It's almost like therapy. So I think it's, we're living in an interesting time. Um, if the ecosystem can, can sustain life and, and things can go, can go forward and we're not, and we can transition into, um, a less, um, sort of energy, less extractive tech, less extractive ways of living, less wasteful ways of living. I think we could potentially and avoid conflict and hurting other people for gain for profit. I think we can, we, there is a, a, an interesting time, beautiful time ahead, but I think we can, we can all do it by tapping into and learning about ourselves, about what, what we love and, um, what we want to spend this lifetime doing. And, um, and yeah, and, and working, working hard. So if I'm a young filmmaker, I should just be willing to work my tail off and f have passion. Is that, is that the first two? Yeah. Willing, willing to work your tail off. I think it's, um, something I didn't do well that I wish I would have done well is work for people who are established and really be of service to them. Hmm. I think you find now that I'm older and I'm looking for help and I definitely fit the bill with this description. When I was younger, you see a lot of young people who are kind of in it for themselves. Sorry. I'm only laughing because you're 34. You're really not that old. Yeah, but I got started 15 years ago. Chew. So it's, it's been Chew. enough time of growth. So yeah, when I, when I was young and getting and you know, now I'm, I'm in, I'm in the control of, of pretty good sized budgets for different projects and I'm needing to hire help. And, um, I, I see a lot of young, young people, um, that are really interested in just what they can gain. And there is so much more if you are in it, if you, we're all in it selfishly in this lifetime, right? I mean, you, you can, you can look at life that way that ultimately everybody's selfish and even love is a selfish feeling of how good it feels to be in love. But, if you are in it for yourself, there's actually more you can gain by truly being of service to somebody who has more experience because it creates, they will want to help you out more in your future and they will want to help you um, with connections or they'll, they'll impart more knowledge that they have. Um, if you're just kind of looking at things for, for your own projects and you're not really willing to take the time to be of service to other people. I think we're short young, young filmmakers are shortchanging themselves on what they can learn. And that's mostly my own advice to myself. I think I was so 
anxious out of the gates to create work. And I think that might speak even to needing validation as opposed to really being interested in, in learning. I wasn't as interested in learning when I was young. And that's something that's come in the last 10 or five to 10 years is really being more interested, being more fascinated with being interested than interesting. Um, and cause I think once you get a certain level of validation, you don't need any more and you're more interested in learning. Um, and then to take a little bit of a tangent, I think we are in a time right now where we need validation more than anything. And social media can creep up and take fill that void or we can be searching for that in friends and, and young people in general as, as, as we've broken down our culture into it. Do we have less and less culture? We have less and less town squares and more and more suburban strip malls um, where it used to be gathering places where people could figure out their social um, standing and learn from each other. It's more about buying and working. So I think in that is created this really deep void in people needing to be okay and needing to be special and valuable. And I think that really social media can be used and it has probably taken off so much because of our need for that. And I think that in general as being really good artists and for me art is about expanding the narrative of what the culture the, the pervasive narrative of the culture or challenging what the culture holds to be valuable art can can be this really crafty way of 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 questioning and i feel like art has increasingly become about marketing and that line between real art and just marketing is increasingly blurred. And I think a lot of that has to do with our susceptibility and, and lack of really la our lack of self-worth and our, and therefore our incredible need for, um, for validation. And if we continually place products in that zone is, as, as you know, you, you can be val you can be validated, but, you have to buy this product. I think it, that's, it's a scary thing. So I think as a young filmmaker, as a young storyteller, as a young athlete, you know, strive to like yourself, strive to be, strive to be yourself, strive to make real friendships. Um, and then ironically, you'll probably be more interesting of a person and you can turn around and work with brands and companies or work with nonprofits or, or just have a, a even even more amazing could be just having an audience that supports what you do through Patreon or, or through Kickstarter and, and just supports you directly in your journey of, of learning because so few people have the opportunity to really learn hands on these days. Um, much more sort of, there's a lot more technological learning, whether it's through Google or whether it's, you know, through video games, but there's a lot less experiential learning that's going on where people are actually in this mindset of receiving There's a lot of traveling going on. There's a lot of aspirational traveling and inspirational lifestyle gurus going out there. But I would argue that more and more of them are having pressure to just produce content and just make things look good, regardless of what they're experiencing or experiencing things just to put them on a blog or just for the, for the end result, that's an easy thing to creep up um, and, and learning and working more and spending more time on this, on yourself and really, truly wanting a really, truly cultivating a fascination for the world. I think, well, those are, those are things I would try to instill in my kids. And I think the more interesting stories, more interesting art, real art that challenges, that challenges the narrative of our time, that you can dip into companies, you can dip into that, but as long as you're holding your, you're not being, not, not allowing your journey to be co-opted by brands and being told what to do, um, or allowing, or, or, or letting the seduction of fame, you know, draw you from your path of learning, then that's, that's the, a very long winded and unthought through answer to your end question. I don't know. I've heard you talked about social media before and, I always love talking to you about it, Cyrus, because you've been in the thick of it. You know, you're at the forefront of it. You're in it. And um, 
you know, I have a love hate relationship with social media. It allows me to get my stories to more people, but it's incredibly annoying sometimes. And I don't know. Um, when we last spoke, you had some interesting views about the evolution of social media. And I'd love to, for you to just share a little bit about where you think it's going and, and kind of how, if people are going to use it, the best way to use it. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're seeing this line be blurred between people who are paid ambassadors who can speak to a small demographic or a targeted demographic, and you're seeing that marketing is getting broken up and stratified into like sub niches, and therefore people who can whatever it is. I just learned I learned like two weeks ago that there's a thing called professional video game players. Like that is crazy, <laughs> you know. And, and there's professional people who live in vans now, which yep. is just crazy. It's crazy. I mean, it's like the whole the whole thing is 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 fine, you know. I mean, it's fine. I think it's it's about whatever you're doing, pushing pushing it back against. Are you interested? Are you not getting caught up in your own delusions of grandeur? Are you um, using the platform to share the findings? your findings as an interested person or are you using the platform to share how interesting you are, you think you are, you know? So I think that's what it comes down to for me. And I think that working with brands is, you know, we all have to make a living and I'm not a rich kid. Um, so I think in, in a lot of ways you can, there's, there's too much hate on people who are sponsored. I think that you can easily become too, critical of people and you know i think that it's it's a really beautiful thing that people are able to be creative with the ways that they make make a living and be their own boss and make their own mistakes and their own triumphs and share that on social media because that's that's the way we move culture forward and so in a lot of ways i'm really thankful and amazed by social media and and this um dissolving of these ivory towers, you know, to make a film when you, when I was just started out, you needed so much money to make a professional looking film. And now you need hardly anything and you can make something if you're a good storyteller and you, you can purchase everything you need for very cheaply. So I'm excited to see what happens. I'm excited to see what comes about. And, um, I just think that, that we are in a place where there's an interesting redefining that needs to happen about, people as being paid ambassadors for brands and and kind of where how much you let that kind of influence your daily life and how much how much you're just living something that is what you would normally do and i think that's a question that is very important for people to ask themselves are you if you're living this lifestyle if you're a lifestyle guru you know talking i i have friends who are different ambassadors for different companies. And um, if you're a quote unquote lifestyle guru, you know, does that mean that you have to be, be the bearer of knowledge and things that oftentimes people that are lifestyle gurus are not completely equipped to, to, to be sharing, or are you able to be transparent about that? Are you able to, you know, learn and share your journey of learning with other people, you know? So, I love that you said, you know, it's good to be interested rather than always interesting. I think that that really resonated, especially with me. I was just around a bunch of people that are doing the van life thing and living out of their vans. And some of them really seemed stoked. Some of them, I got the sense that they were doing for that for Instagram followers. And some just, you know, were doing it because they're broke and they had to live in a van. So it was really interesting to see like, a bunch of different ways people were using vans as well through social media uh, this last weekend. I want to ask you, you know, because you did van life and then I have a bunch of other questions. If someone is going to live in a van or do it for a very short amount of time, what are three things they need to know or need to take with them? The three things they need to know and what they need to take with them. Yeah. Or shouldn't take with them. Like what are three things that they must know, take oh. or not have with them? I would love to do a full oh, okay. podcast with you on just like the other side of van life, but <laughs> that would be another, that would be a full episode. We'll do that another time. 
Well, I don't know if it's three things that the three things are universal. I don't really think like that, but I think that it's got to be, you know, get a van. I would not get a Westphalia. I grew up, my dad still has his bus from 1978, a, a roll top. It's the only car he's ever driven for 30 years and um, almost 30 years now. And um, no, 40, Jesus. Wow. Almost 40 years. Yeah. That's insane. Um, and every single family trip was, was spent breaking down somewhere. So that was like beaten out of me at a young age <laughs> to ever want to get a Volkswagen. They're beautifully designed, but unless you're just going to completely spend a ton of money and redo the insides with you know, a really great mechanic. And even that's fraught with problems because it's going to be a Frankenstein um, or you're a great mechanic. Um, don't do a VW because you're cool. I rode, I drove a Ford Econo line forever. That was my first van. I moved into that when I was 21 and that is a great, they're, they're great, but they have really horrible turning radiuses. They have horrible gas mileage. And after getting my sprinter, I would never do anything different. I mean, I think I got lucky. Mine runs really well. I've heard some people have issues and when they break down mechanically, it's hard to fix them yourselves and they're incredibly expensive. So, you know, having, I'm somewhat financially successful now. I'm not broke anymore. And so that's not a problem. Like I can pay to get my van worked on, but if you have the money, the turning radius, the ease of driving, the get the fuel economy, everything about the functionality, the, the ergonomics of sprinters are insane. Um, I haven't checked out the new Nissan big transit vans, but um, I assume they're pretty cool or Ford transits. I'm not sure who made them. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the van itself, once you choose the van, then it's, I would just say, don't do anything at all. Just put a bed, just put a mattress in the back and live in it and just start looking at, and, and, you know, buy a stove and then go to Home Depot and tinker and build a little shelf for your stove that like doesn't fall out. I mean, you know, you, you might build a shelf and then it like you start driving and your, your stove falls in the ground or something. I mean, I, I would just one step at a time and build based on your needs or build based on how you find yourself living in that, in that zone. Cause the beauty of vans is they're so small that you can build things yourself and you can really customize your space based on your needs. Um, and I think that a lot of times people, I wouldn't, you know, look on just some Instagram feed or some blog for, you know, ideas solely. You can do that, but, I would also spend time and figure out what you like and what setup actually fits you. Um, if you're going to spend a lot of time in it, I think we're, we're right now entering the time and the vast majority of your listeners and, and, and people who like vans in general are not going to be living in their vans full time. Maybe they're going to buy a van, fix it up, make it look rad inside and then go on weekend trips or go on, you know, two weeks in the summer to some place that they're camping in the Southwest or something like that. In that case, blogs and those kinds of things are fine. But if you're actually going to live in it and you're going to get a ton of work done, I would I would start really simple. Um, I would probably get a Ford Econo line just because they're cheap and they keep running. Um, and I would start really simple and make your own shit at, at Home Depot. And um, but yeah, I think there's different there's different kinds of users, right? Yeah, for sure. I, I think you hit it on the head. You you gave such good advice. That was great. Thank you. How do you how do you find balance? Like what are your strategies and tactics? You are pretty busy and making a film takes a ton of energy and you know, you've got a lot of different roles you play in life. What are your kind of go to tactics to, to kind of reset to find balance? Mm. I don't know. I think balance is about loving yourself. Mm. at the end of the day, which has been a long struggle for me. I think, um, in my twenties, I, I, my girlfriend and I were talking about this, like you get this voice. <laughs> we all, it seems like everybody I talk to has this voice inside. That's like the voice of the teacher or the parent or the counselor or the principal in your head that makes you do stuff that you don't want to be doing at the, in the moment. And that voice gets to be really strong. And when we let that voice take over, we like, are really productive and we get stuff done, but isn't always the most loving voice because, because when we're kids, we just want to be outside and play, you know, and not have responsibilities and let things kind of 
flow naturally, but we're in this society where we've got to grind. We've got to learn how to grind. And so for me, it was that voice that was like, grind, grind, you're not good enough. What you're going to do isn't going to be good enough. And I think that tends to shift me and the people I talk to out of balance. Because if you let that take over too much, there's never downtime. There's never, you know, there's never feeling okay about taking downtime. And so for me, it was about really making peace with that voice and, and letting that, you know, using that voice as a tool when I needed to get shit done. And I was like having too much fun and knowing that I was not following through with my responsibilities to different clients and, and, and my colleagues. And, but then being able to turn that voice off and just being a kid again, uh, I think that's kind of where I found balance. That's awesome. And I love that you have a girlfriend who seems really like a badass, super smart, um, excited to meet her one of these days. What else do you do right now for fun? Like to be, to feel like a kid again? Hmm. Well, I've gotten to surf very little in the last three years by making Mallet Earth and starting Monda and working for Guayaquil. It's just surfing. I mean, I'm in, I'm on the South shore of Oahu and I've just been surfing every day and the waves have been small, but it hasn't been crowded and Oh, it's so great. It's so great to surf without a wetsuit. It's so nice with the offshore winds. I mean, you can just, you know, there's a reason why people come to Waikiki all over the world and surf these hundreds of little reef breaks here and surfing is the best. So fun. I I agree. I don't think there's like anything that warm water surfing can't cure in this world. We were just talking about that. Oh. I want to move to Oregon. And Johnny reminded me, like, you hate cold water. Like, you love being able to surf without a wetsuit. And it's true. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard to find balance. But I like green trees. And I like to run in trails. And I like not having to pay $2 million, The idea of not having to pay $2 million for a house to live somewhere. <laughs> You're so articulate and thoughtful. You know, who, who, I'm wondering, like, you must have had really good parents or a really good mom. Who's kind of really shaped you growing up? Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, I, I guess my parents, you know, um, my parents were both teachers and artists and um, just asked me a lot of questions when I was younger and I was only a child. So I had a lot of time to talk and listen and, be around older people. Um, so I don't know. I just maybe all that conversating and, and also probably camping and stuff and living and living alone for that long while it makes you pretty introspective and forces me to, has forced me to like really own my shit and learn about my own, my own self and, you know, get to the bottom of things that I might think I'm, think I know why I'm doing things, but I feel like any any time anybody spends a month in the desert by themselves, they start to get to know what they're really thinking and why they're really doing what they're doing, you know? Very true. Are there any books or films that even shops that you went to as a kid that kind of helped influence you? I know you talked about our buddy Surfy Surfy, formerly the Longboard Grotto. Besides that, like any books or films you read growing up? Yeah. I mean, in terms of surf films like Jay Brothers Adrift, a lot of people haven't seen that. It was really artistically done. Joe Scott did an amazing job and kind of, I grew up longboarding because that's the kind of waves that were local. And my dad longboarded. So I was like the first longboard film that had a lot of style, great music, and it was kind of executed artistically and then you know I'm, I'm really interested in growing food it's the main reason I moved up to Washington so I've been reading a lot of books about horticulture and our ideas of wilderness and and what they mean and um, there's a really great book um, called One Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka and he was a Japanese gardener who just looking at like I mean, my film Island Earth delves into like feeding large societies and large farming systems, but 
it's always been a goal of mine to produce a lot of my own calories. And when you're doing it on a small scale for yourself, there's a lot of interesting ways of growing food that acknowledge the, in, the, the innate intelligence of the natural ecosystems around you and not fight those to like for your lust of having like a perfectly groomed looking garden with lawn and, and, you know, like your typical like English garden looking thing. So you, he has this book all about like kind of honoring it's like Zen gardening. It's do nothing, do nothing farming where he observes the ecosystems around him and then just kind of throws down plants that might compete well with the natural environment. And then he goes out and like learns how to forage on his own place that is basically just like a native place, but he has inoculated it with his own food crops, but not so much that nature will kick it out because, you know, anyway, it's, it's a great book. So I, I highly recommend that if anybody who's interested in organic gardening. Oh, it sounds taking, awesome. Taking growing your food kind of to like the, the Jedi, like Yoda level kind of thing. <laughs> He's kind of like the Yoda, in my opinion. No, it sounds awesome. Last night we had like seaweed wraps where we wrapped pieces, of sea- like tons of like beautiful salads and greens and all sorts of vegetables inside these seaweed wraps. I know it sounds kind of disgusting to some people, but it was really delicious. And we were thinking like, if we had to grow all this and then actually pick it, it would have just taken forever. So I highly respect the fact that you're growing your own food and teaching people about it. I think it's really cool. What are you growing real quick on your garden? Well, yeah, I mean, what you said of having it take forever, that's what I think is, is can be pushed back on, you know, by looking at people who, if you look at any farming system, in some way, we're looking to create an abundance of calories on a place in a place that nature doesn't normally have. And if we do that smartly and we integrate with the local ecosystem, we can do that without nature rejecting it. And I mean, I would love to have an organic farmer on here, but I believe that like a trident, a full on organic farmer, but I'm pretty dang sure that the vast majority of work that is, that a farmer takes on is the planning and the sort of like weeding and, and the, the tending of nature so that you keep what you're doing from being invaded by other things or being, you know, it's, it's the checking in on the plants, it's the watering of the plants, it's the fertilizing of the plants, it's the, it's the spraying and, and protecting it from different funguses and insects and weeds. And so if you can be more in harmony, you have less work to do and you can go out and just grab, grab things, grab things, grab things. So I think that what I'm trying to do is challenge in my own yard, because I do have limited time, and use myself as a Petri dish and my own experiment is how much food and how many calories can I grow while living a non-farmer lifestyle with traveling part of the year with, with not always being consistent on, on when I seed and when I fertilize and when I do all these things and letting trying nature take over as much as possible. So in that, I've tried to research varieties of crops that number one, native um, natives have used um, in that area. Native Americans have used in that area for a long time. Staples. Number two, other farmers. I live on the street where there's, a lot of people are doing permaculture and it's you know, people have moved there to hunt and live off the land and fish. <clears throat> so what, what crops kind of do grow and take over like weeds, you know, for them, like what, what just does so well that you don't need to do any work. So I've been Jerusalem artichoke does that. Asparagus does that. Jerusalem artichoke is a sort of an underground chestnut. It's also known as sunchoke. Um, if you just leave it in there, it'll take over. I could, um, um, potatoes and sweet potatoes do that in the lasagna compost. I could throw those in my compost and they will grow and the worms don't eat anything that's alive still. Um, fruit trees do that. Apples do incredibly well where I am. Pears do incredibly well. Cherries do incredibly well. Peaches have a bit of a, of an issue with rot cause it's pretty wet where I am, but I planted those anyway, just to see filberts do incredibly well. Plums do incredibly well. So berries do incredibly well. So grapes do incredibly well. Um, Kiwis do incredibly well. So planting things that are just going to take over. And then a a ton of herbs and mint 
are, are a ton of herbs, things like mint, um, things like arugula, things like um, Asian mustard greens, you know, that they will compete with the weeds. So, and even weeds themselves, dandelions and plantains, when you boil those, you know, they're incredibly, weeds themselves are nature's way of healing the land. They go into damaged, disrupted ecosystem after a fire, or after anything is, and you know, maybe a boulder comes through and unearths some raw earth. The first thing that will pop up in the ecosystem is weeds and weeds are dynamic accumulators. They have incredibly deep tap roots that pull up um, nutrients from way down, pull up minerals, and then they die. And then those, they create soil and that dying, then their, their biomass then decomposes on the surface where there's, where it has originally been devoid of nutrient or, or, nu- or lacking nutrients, those weeds will then take over. So when weeds come in, they're coming in for a purpose and they're coming in to compete. They oftentimes out, I'm sorry, they oftentimes out compete other things because they're the first, they're nature's Marines. They're the first line of defense, but also they're incredibly high in nutrients because they, their job is to accumulate nutrients. So thinking about eating weeds and then thinking about anti animals of the system that kind of take care of themselves, chickens that need to be moved once in a while, they can have a tenant, but you know, in the beginning, it's going to be more about the trees, the herbs, the root crops, the perennial, you know, perennial herbs, perennial root crops, perennial trees, things that don't need to be replanted every year, things that can establish and work with the soil. Um, and then fishing and hunting. Um, I think I could probably, where I live is I'm really lucky and, and I chose to live where I live for a very particular reason, South facing rich soils, um, great rainfall, um, a ton of, of animals and fish. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a place you can live off the land. So that's the goal. And, and, um, and again, another super long answer to your question because I'm excited about it. <laughs> no, it's so cool. I mean, when I met you, you had just gone to that permaculture class and I had been living in New Zealand and we were basically trying to live off the weeds, which was this like incredible spinach that just the locals would just give it away. And Johnny and I were so stoked. We'd eat this like really bitter spinach and tons of kale and tons of sun chokes and learned how to cook those. And pretty much a lot of the same foods you're describing because the weather and climate in New Zealand is really similar to kind of Washington, Oregon, where you're living. So it's exciting. I mean, we really want a garden. So it's awesome that you're doing that. And it's cool to see people living off the land and learning about it and, and doing it in a sustainable way. Because yeah, how we're doing it right now, it's it doesn't seem... I mean, obviously, we all need to go see Island Earth. I think that's important. Really quickly, Cyrus, where can people find the movie? It's, it's available on iTunes and uh, Vimeo. Awesome. Um, yeah. So right now it's available. Yeah. Okay, cool. So even when this comes out, go to Find Island Earth on iTunes. We'll put links in the show notes. If you could go back in time and tell your 15-year-old self one piece of advice, what would you tell him? I think it just goes back to that whole be interested thing. Yeah. You know, don't spend so don't be in such a hurry. Um for validation just just um spend time learning mm. you know because i think being proactive and going after a wild idea can oftentimes come with not taking out for me it came part and parcel with not taking enough time to learn and um if you could we ask everybody this if you could fly an eco-friendly plane across the world and it had one message to the world what would that message be Oh man, I don't, I don't pretend to know any of that. <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm just waking up to the fact that I, I live in a country that is incredibly exploitive and extractive. And for me to, pre- I think one of the problems with our culture is, or one of the, one of the ways it works so well is it makes the people who are in it think that they have advice for other people. Mm. And I think that it's really a time for our culture to really take a step back and learn and stop thinking that we have the solution to everybody else's problems and start learning from other people because our it's our system it's the western imperialist system it's it's the colonial system that i think has gotten us in a lot of trouble so yeah well i think that's probably one of the most honest answers i've gotten for that question so thank you cyrus what what's next and where can people find more about you 
Well, you know, being a surfer, I'm really passionate about the ocean and, and about coral reefs. And, you know, I've, I've learned in my research that coral reefs are the, are the lungs of the ocean and, and coral is, or in the ocean is an incredible carbon sink. And because of more carbon being in the atmosphere and pollution and lots of, of, of nebulous problems that we don't totally understand, the reefs are dying at an alarming rate. And the reefs are basically the oceans. They're the ocean's mangroves. They're the ocean's um, tropical forests. Um, you know, we talk about cutting down the Amazon or losing reefs is just as important. And oxybenzone um, in, in your average sunscreen and what we slather on to enjoy the waves has a direct impact on killing the reefs at a very high level, way more than I understood, just such a small amount can hurt coral reefs. It's not an alarmist um, stance taken by, you know, organic food companies, but it's a real problem. And so because of that, and also my dad getting skin cancer when I was a kid, and I've, I've really, you know, in Cordero, we had the tutorials of how to make your own sunblock. I've been really passionate with my friends about creating Monda, and creating, you know, the most high performance and earth and human friendly um sun sunblock and sun care uh line that we can and we're coming out with a with a cream um at the end of this this summer and we already have a paste that goes on your on your face and your real, most sensitive areas and i'm really excited now to be done with island earth to so just dive into that and create cool content that educates people as to why it's important and, and just also fun you know dumb stuff um are, are for the for the branding of, of my own company it's it's exciting to be an entrepreneur and to, to be working with my friends and maybe creating something from scratch so that's what i'm focused on right now and then also telling stories uh, with guayaki guayaki has been incredibly supportive and really given me kind of free range to create stories that i'm excited about so we just put out a film about um a band called rising appalachia um, they're, they're activist feminist musicians um, in the South. And my next film that comes out soon is about B corporations and the power for that business structure to kind of help, you know, to use business for positive change and not just look at capitalism as a negative thing, but looking at what parts of capitalism are a negative thing and changing that um, and the actual legal structure, the legal entity of a company. So I'm excited about putting that out. And then we have just a bunch of other short films around, you know, things that I think could, if, if that information got out there for me, it, you know, traveling and making films, I realize that they are resource intensive endeavors. They, they create, they take carbon, they take a lot to make. So if I'm going to make something, if I'm going to put something out in the world, if I'm going to go to a place, if I'm going to travel, why am I doing that? You know, and Guayaquil really allows me to think about stories that if, you know, if something was just out there, I think to myself, if something was out there that clearly explained this, that could be really catalyzing for good, good things to happen in the world. So if we are going to expend the resources of the company to make something, um, then it better be something that, that is poignant in the moment that can help. So I'm excited about both of those things. Cyrus, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing all of your information with us. I mean, you're, you're so interesting. You're so thoughtful. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the films that you've been creating. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Shelby. Thanks for having me on and doing this. I love, I love podcasts. I think they're the, the wave of the future for listening to, to in-depth content and not having to have our eyeballs being fried out by watching videos all day. <laughs> So thanks for doing this and, and thanks for having me on. Thank you to Cyrus for coming on the show and recording this for the second time because we had a little technical difficulty the first time. You have a huge life. You've already had a huge life. The future is even brighter. Thank you to Danner for sponsoring this episode. If you get a chance, go watch Island Earth. I feel like I have my pulse on what's happening to our food and the organic movement but this was an eye-opening movie. 
one that if you ever eat a fruit or a vegetable, you definitely should watch. You can download the movie on iTunes. I'll have links in the show notes on the website. Just go to wildideasworthliving.com, click play, and a show notes page will load. You can also check out Cyrus's other movies, all the things he's up to on cyrussutton.com. And if you follow him on Instagram, he actually writes some really thoughtful posts and captions. Thank you to you for listening to this show wherever you are. You can now help support Wild Ideas Worth Living through Amazon purchases. If you go to the show on wildideasworthliving.com, click on support. And through Amazon purchases, you can help contribute with whatever you buy to the show. Thanks again wherever you are in the world. Don't forget the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. We'll see you next week. We have some awesome guests lined up for July. Mm -hmm.